This is the Hall Institute's forum. We're back here once again to look at the question of stem cell research. Uh, when we had finished our second segment, Father, you were talking about the different types of stem cell. Would you pick that up again? Yeah, one of the uh, other very interesting developments you were sort of asking about alternative approaches here involves this recent breakthrough, and it really is a major breakthrough, which permits you to take an adult cell, basically a skin cell, a good old-fashioned skin cell, and by introducing a few genes to convert it into essentially an embryonic type stem cell. So as you can imagine, this, this clears a lot of the ethical hurdles because no embryos are required or involved at any stage of this. You simply transmute the skin cell into a stem cell of the embryonic variety, the most flexible, most powerful variety. So this has been seen as a a kind of benefit not only scientifically but ethically that it'll allow us to in a sense charge forward in this area of research without crossing any fundamental moral lines uh, and there's been a lot of excitement around this even some of the pioneers in the field some of the people who opened up this field originally like Jamie Thompson at the University of Wisconsin Madison the first person who isolated stem cells from human embryos has said, you know, isn't it a great thing? I opened up a field and I closed it because he also published a paper then just recently on this new approach to getting stem cells without destroying any embryos. Aren't there some researchers, though, say that that's really not as effective as continuing work on embryonic stem cell work? There certainly are. I mean, there are some who will always say we have to have embryos, and specifically we have to have human embryos. And the argument that is, you know, most commonly used is this is the gold standard. That's the phrase that they like to use. Uh, but that argument is evaporating as the science moves forward. There's a lot of uh, indicators now that even the technique by which you introduce these genes and make this change occur, that you can clean up the cells completely afterwards. You can pull out the, uh, the, the segments of DNA that were put in originally, they can be completely excised, and you have none of the virus left if you do the technique properly. So, you know, the claim that there's a gold standard there, well, it becomes, what, what does a gold standard really mean? It certainly doesn't mean that you're providing cures or benefits to anyone, uh, and these cells behave in many regards. Uh, virtually indistinguishably from those that are derived from embryonic stem cells. And the whole question of studying signaling pathways and so on, all of that is amenable to this kind of an approach which doesn't require crossing any ethical lines. Dr. Cohen, in your research, does this work as well for you as uh, what you've been used to working with? We are just actually starting this type of techniques and uh, Father Tad is ac you know, accurate because the original techniques used were kind of messy, and I think it was a rush to get pu you know, papers published between two or three very uh, notable labs. But as the technique is published and we get the, the reagents in many other labs, we'll be able to assess whether this reprogramming of any garden variety cell actually works. So within a year or two from now, we'll have 20 to 30 publications, and really the proof will be how many labs can reproduce it. And by cleaning up the techniques, removing the different viral sequences that are used to transfer these genes into cells, or even coming up with drugs that emulate the effect of the gene will allow us to reprogram cells. And in fact, it'll benefit a variety of different streams of research because if we could discover what makes a cell embryonic-like, maybe we can stop it. So in cancer, when cells divide incessantly, maybe we'll learn a lesson how to stop cancer cells. Are you using this in your own lab, this technique? The technique, yes. And you're focusing on mainly spinal cord injuries? Well, we're actually, um, the way the, the center, the WM Keck Center for Collaborative Neuroscience works is we're roughly eight to nine or ten scientist groups working on a problem of spinal cord regeneration. So my group produces the cells, either adult human cells um, from bone marrow or cord blood or other placenta, other, other tissue, or from uh, from NIH-approved or non-approved uh, human embryonic stem cell lines. So we tried to create a bank of cells for transplant to see which one works the best. If blood cells work and cure spinal cord injury, great. If bone marrow, fat, 
skin stem cells or these reprogrammed cells, then, then fine. Um, so we're looking for the best source to cure those or treat those diseases. The, when the federal government decided they were going to cure polio, one of the great case studies of the effectiveness of science working with government or government working with science, they searched out the people they thought were likely comers who were going to make this possible. They apparently chose one person, put all their resources and money on him. The March of Dimes, I guess, also funded it. And they ended up with the first uh, vaccine to deal with the question of, uh, of stopping polio. Should we be doing that really with stem cell research? Should we stop proliferating the researchers' efforts and really focus down and say we're going to put our money on this particular technique and solution? Well, in this case, it doesn't make uh, much sense because polio took over 70 years to find a treatment and, and finally a cure. And there were actually two people who invented Salk and Sabin, the two different types of uh, vaccines. And with stem cell research, you're talking about so many different type of human cells, organs, and systems, and diseases. You can't count on one type of cell or one approach to actually work really well. We may decide that to cure one disease, one stem cell is better. And learning the lessons from human embryonic stem cells or reprogrammed cells will give us the, the, the clues we need. Very good. Very good. Father? Have yeah, any I think uh, remarks? yeah, I think also the uh, you know the mechanisms that exist in the federal government for dispersing money through the National Institutes of Health, there are a number of good checks and balances over that. So what you end up doing is giving money to the best researchers, and that's very encouraging. I think that's the approach we've always taken. It's given us some great results historically, and it's something we should continue to push rather than initiatives like happened here in New Jersey where you try to take money from the state taxpayers and sort of funnel it in directions that circumvent that government mechanism. We've had the opportunity here today to examine in just a brief way some of the important consequences of stem cell research from three people who are intently committed to the question. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to welcome them here today and to listen to what they have to say and to try to make it comprehensible to me and to you and to others because the work is very, very complicated. I think we've done that a little bit. Uh, we're going to have a rare departure and have a second show. We're going to examine more of the ethical and public policy implications on the question of embryonic stem cell research. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here. We're honored, Paul. We appreciate your giving us your personal perspective as well. And um, we look forward to having you join us for our second show. Thank you very much. Thank you.